In today's video, we cut deeper as I test the limits of the world's most powerful desktop diode laser. We will max it out as I attempt to slice through solid steels, stainless steel, brass, aluminum, and even copper. Why cut metals in the first place? I will attempt to prove its usefulness as I create a metal product that's thick and durable that would be sure to sell. Then, like I promised in the last video, I buy an X-Tool multicolor screen printer kit for one of you. I want that. Did I sell my 20 clocks or did I have to sell my overly expensive hairless cat Norman? What? Plus, be on the lookout in this video to win as I still have more machines to give back to all of you in this incredible laser community here on YouTube. Set your focal point as we turn it up to 11 with this 70 watt diode laser. Uh, who by the end of this might just earn the title of desktop plasma cutter. A laser myth that has been said for years now is that desktop diode lasers cannot cut metals. We first busted this myth when the first true 20 watt diode lasers first came out about two years ago. An article was even published about my findings by a reputable technology website. So if it's on the internet, it has to be true, right? Now I say no to a lot of free lasers, but this one really caught my attention. IKEA was the first in the laser race to reach an astonishing 70 watt diode laser. Now don't hate me for taking another laser, cause if you've been following my channel, you'll know that eventually this setup will end up with one of you. But today my question is, will three and a half times the power equal triple the cutting capabilities? Let's find out. There is one major difference between plasma cutters and diode lasers. Plasma cutters use an electrical arc between the cutter's electrode and the workpiece, ionizing with gas creating plasma, often reaching temperatures over 20,000 degrees Celsius. That is then shot out at a high velocity used to cut through metals. In contrast, diode lasers are using electricity converted to a blue light LED, normally around the 450 nanometer wavelength. These only have a 5.5 watt of output power each. But in this case, there are 14 individual LEDs, all combined with mirrors and are brought together to produce 77 watts, which is rated at just 70, probably due to the loss of power from mirrors and such. All of this light power is focused to a tiny point of just 0.15 millimeters by 0.2 millimeters, or about the thickness of a single eyelash. This is all just like how some have done harnessing the light power of the sun to cut through random objects like wood, rocks, or even, like we will test today, metals. The setup took me about 110 minutes total, with majority spent on building the metal enclosure. The laser itself went together very quickly, but then the metal working panel took me an extra 45 minutes alone because I will say the tiny print on those instructions were not so good, and I ended up building it backwards with my first attempt. Though I do like the spike design as it has minimal contact with the materials above, making for some really clean cuts and less chance of the metals welding to the panel itself. The clamps are a nice touch too, especially for cutting metal, as metals tend to warp if they get too hot, but the bolts provided could be cut much shorter as they protrude so far up that I ended up bumping them many times with the head of the laser itself. It has a built-in camera and overall the build quality feels nicely done. The exhaust fan that comes with the enclosure is very strong, but it's extremely loud and always on. It would have been nice if the exhaust fan was integrated with the laser and had a delayed off after completing a job, but the only way to stop it is to manually unplug it. I think I may just bypass this fan completely in the future and add a quiet option like an AC Infinity inline fan. I really like the auto level feature though for me sometimes it would malfunction and take a few attempts to get the correct height, but this could have been user error. Before we move on, here is my safety and legal disclaimer. I will be using this machine in ways not intended by the original manufacturer. I have disabled the door safety switch for filming and testing purposes. 
there could be potential health risk associated with the fumes from cutting and engraving of metals. I, nor Ikir, condone anyone to attempt to replicate the practices you will see me do in this video here. With the machine all set up, I jumped right into metal cutting from my giant box full of metals that I've put together for this exact reason of testing laser cutting abilities. I spent days going back and forth with different metals, speeds, and techniques to cut the thickest I could go on steel. That's 22 gauge steel. Stainless steel, brass, aluminum, and even the toughest, copper. With all of my testing throughout the years with the 20 watt, 40 watt, and now the 70 watt, I have found these three things to be essential to be successful when cutting metals. My three secrets to metal cutting with a diode laser are, one, the pierce. I have found that setting a delay at the beginning of a cut allows the laser to pierce through the material. This allows the heat to flow through and not build up heat that can cause warping. This can be set up in Lightburn if you go to the advanced tab to set a delay in a power setting of 100%. I set mine with a 2000 millisecond or a two second delay, but you can go with what's best for your application. Number two, high PSI. You need a high flow of air to blow away that molten metal. Here is a look at some steel I tried to cut with the stock air assist on its highest setting. Even on high, the molten metal just builds up and creates a mess and produces a very undesirable cut with lots of slag buildup. In comparison, here is the same thickness metal but with 40 PSI of constant airflow. I use an eight gallon California air compressor, which is super quiet. But with any actual compressor, they will create condensation, which can build up on the lens and fog the laser completely, blocking out the beam. So you must also have a water to air separator. I had a single one in line, but on this particularly humid day in Georgia, it was not enough. So I borrowed a secondary air water separator from my RMJ750 to get me through my test. But I will add a link in the description to a unit that I would recommend all in one for anyone using a compressor with their lasers. And number three, one pass if possible. I have tested it with both the slowest at one pass or running it as fast up to 10 passes. I have found that if you do not get through in the first pass, then the material will start to build up heat, causing it to warp and pushing it out of focus ruining the material. So if you can't get through in one pass, then the material may just be too thick at the current wattage you have. Lightburn allows you to type in the slowest speed of 0.02 millimeters a second, but I measured it and timed it, and the slowest I could get the machine to move was actually 0.04 millimeters a second, or 2.4 millimeters a minute. Here are the results I ended up with, with the toughest material first, and I'll save the easiest for last. It all ends up in this order, which I believe we can contribute to the thermal conductivity, which I had not thought of until all of you let me know about it in the comments in my first metal cutting video, which is a metal's ability to conduct heat throughout itself. First is copper, with a thermal rating of 401. It was the toughest, then aluminum at 235. Next was brass with 109. Then I had some trouble with stainless steel, even though its rating is only 14. I would guess that this has to do with the initial reflectivity of it, which I could probably mitigate by coating the surface with something to absorb the light energy better. Maybe even just some tempera paint. And the easiest from my test was steel with a thermal conductivity rating of just 43. I believe since we see a correlation here with the cutting ability and its thermal conductivity, we could theoretically go look up any other metal, say gold, with a rating of 314, and guess that our cutting abilities would fall between copper and aluminum. But unless some of you have some gold you want to send me, I don't think I'll be testing that anytime soon. Here are the max thicknesses I was able to cut 
and the speed I had to use for each metal. Copper. I was only able to cut 0.1 millimeters at 1 millimeters a second. Brass. I could cut 0.1 millimeters at an incredible speed of 30 millimeters a second. Here's a clip of that in real time. But the thickest I could go was 0.2 millimeters at 3 millimeters a second. With the aluminum, I only had 0.2 millimeters to test, and it was these little metal business cards that you can get. But I could do it at 7 millimeters a second with a normal coating, or 10 millimeters a second with the colored aluminum business cards. With stainless steel, I got all the way up to 0.4 millimeters of thickness at a slow speed of 0.75 millimeters a second. And lastly, steel. I was able to cut through 22 gauge steel, which measures at 0.8 millimeters of thickness. I bought this from Home Depot, but it did take five passes at one millimeters a second. And with that many passes, when I tried it on a larger project, it warped the metal beyond what would be feasible to use. But I can't say that I wasn't excited when I was able to cut through metal this thick. But I do have some 0.4 millimeter steel that's colored, brass and black. And I was able to cut that at three millimeters a second. And then the thinner 0.3 millimeter still, I was able to cut at a very impressive speed of seven millimeters a second. Now that I am armed with all these speed settings and I know what I'm capable of with this mini plasma cutter, I wanted to attempt to make something practical out of the metal. I brainstormed for a bit and came up with lots of ideas such as metal hat patches, beard combs, shelf brackets, phone holders, knife blanks, and metal boxes. But I ended up going with something I wanted to build to go out in the yard, and since it's metal, it should last a really long time in the elements, unlike what you get from wood, which, no matter what coating we put on it, they always seem to turn gray from the sun and rot away from the rain. I wanted to make a number address plate to go outside since sometimes there is some confusion in our deliveries with my neighbor's house since our mailbox which does have our house number on it but is right on a shared property line so it seems it could be for either house. I first attempted to make this with the 22 gauge steel from Home Depot and even though my small scale test showed that I could cut it with five passes at three millimeters a second this did not work in this case. As the heat started to build up in the metal, it caused it to get so warped that the laser was no longer in focus. So I scrapped that piece of metal and decided to go with the 0.4 millimeter black and brass colored steel. I yet again ran into some problems. I think I was running it a little bit too quick, but I slowed it down and was able to cut it out in one pass, which kept the metal from overheating and warping since the bulk of the heat was passing through with the high PSI of air. The black metal came out with a neat brass outline along where the laser had burned. I designed it to work with these metal standoffs, which look really professional in my opinion. I wish I had some brass ones for this, but today for this example, these will do just fine. You just screw the standoffs to your background, then you can place the number sign right on and hand tighten the top bolts. First, I put it on a tree so we could see it. Then I flipped it around so we could see what it would look like in just brass. And thanks to the power of editing, I can near the image to make the numbers look correct. I liked how the tree looked, but I remembered I had just gotten this fake plastic yard boulder that I thought the sign would look really neat on. So I found a nice flat side on the rock marked my holes with a sharpie, drilled some pilot holes, and mounted the sign on the rock instead. I really liked this, so I found the best spot in the front yard, dug it into the ground, and even picked up a solar spotlight so the light would be illuminated at night. Here's a quick look at how it looks. If you are still here, you might know that I've been trying to show my appreciation to all of you supporting my channel by watching to the end like you did here. 
by giving back to the community. I was sadly unable to get in touch with our last winner, so I did pass it on to the next person, but I'm happy to hear that the Extol D1 Pro Kit that I boxed up went to a couple in Florida that have been down on their luck, and I'm hoping it helps them out in some way. I still have a 10 watt Xtool D1, and if you'd like a chance to win it, leave a comment that starts with the word coconut. Again, that word is coconut. In my last video, I made a bet that I would sell out of my screen printed clocks to buy a screen printer kit for one of you before releasing my next video. I want that. Or I would be forced to sell my hairless cat Norman to fund that giveaway instead. My clocks were first listed over a month now. Remember, I needed to raise $530 for the kit, but I also spent $160 on materials. So that puts me $690 in the hole. After all this time, I can report that I sold one single clock. So a huge thank you to Doug. Doug, if it was legal, I'd be sending you the screen printer kit. Though some of you came out of the woodwork and placed some orders for my digital cut file for my three piece acrylic stand, which after fees and shipping, uh, we can add $48 to the total raised to the multicolor screen printer kit giveaway. That means I'm just $642 in the hole. Ouch. And let's go ahead and pick a winner for the multicolor screen printer kit. I'm going to purchase this on their website and have it shipped directly to you. Silver Arrows Photography, congratulations on winning. It's a tough pill to swallow, but I did fail. And sometimes in business, you will think you have everything figured out, but sometimes ultimately the market will decide for itself. But I will urge you all to not give up, make a pivot and keep trying. I'm going to leave the clocks up for sale at a drastically reduced price. So if you're interested, go get one. But it is with a very sad and heavy heart that I must stick to my word and put up my best buddy, Norman, up for sale. That's it for this one. Until next time, I guess you can catch just me on the next one.